Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage your moderator and distinguished panelists. Come on! Right. Please, Chris Lear, your Managing Director, Professor Darren Achimelo Omoglu and Ian Bremer. You all know everybody on this stage. <laughs> uh, or joining us also is His Excellency Omar Olson Al Olama from. Ah, there you are, sir. Can you hear me? He seems a bit frozen. <laughs> Which is an achievement being in the studio. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the rain got in the system. Oh dear, that's not going well. I can he's see. Now he's reacting. Right, well, we'll see what we can do on that. OK, the ground rules for today's discussion. Oh, can you hear me, Excellency? Uh, I can hear you, yes. Can you well, hear me? We can hear you, but your picture's breaking up, so as long as we can hear you, we can hear your points to be made. Uh, if you can hear me and the panel can hear me, there's only one rule that we start with. Anybody who uses the word transformative, <laughs> I will relieve you of a dollar after the panel and it will go to charity. Can I give you five dollars right now so I feel comfortable <laughs> speaking? Typical IMF wants a standby agreement in <laughs> advance. <laughs> and you'll want a loan before we're finished, <laughs> my guess is. The reason I say that is, and, and congr congratulations to UMD, first of all, on almost nearly, you're just about there for your second term. Excellent news. Uh, the... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> but the reason I say that is, you've chosen this topic on AI, and it is exactly the right topic, but how the hell do we discuss it, or you discuss it and I try and prompt you, without us going in generalities and circles. Hmm. So you start us on that. Well, by uh, concentrating on uh, how much we can say on the basis of what we know that is specific enough to meet the Richard Quest test. <laughs> Don't throw that Should I try? I will, uh, should, I, should I try to, to give you a sense of... Uh, Please, go ahead. So... <laughs> Here is the, the, story, the story we have. Um, over the last year, since the global financial crisis, growth has been disappointing. It has been slowing down and down and down. And when we looked for the reason for it, more than half of the reason is low productivity. And then you say, is there something that is happening that has the promise, or at least the potential, to lift up productivity. And obviously, technology, advancements in the way we live, we work, we interact with each other, is a promise to lift up growth. So that is the, the prospect mm. of the positive. Minister in the UAE, Excellency, when you were appointed, and I've read the story several times, when you were appointed as Minister for AI in 2017, everybody said, well, that's a load of old rubbish. Um, <laughs> why are they bothering with that? But what did you envisage it would be? Uh, thank you, Richard. I, I hope you guys can hear me clearly. Um, I would have loved to be with you all um, today. There's a statement that I've been hearing my whole life that I've seen in practice, which is, when it rains, it pours. I've seen that in real life um, over the last two days, and it's been uh, quite an interesting experience, to say the least. Not transformational yet, uh, Richard, but uh, interesting, to say the least. Um, in 2017, when um, I was appointed, the, the fact of appointing a minister for artificial intelligence was that the UAE believed that the only way for us to diversify our economy and to be a country that is exporting technology rather than importing technology is to actually invest in the technologies that are going to shape future technologies. 
So AI is an enabler, not just uh, as a tool for itself, but it's going to be the core which many of futuristic technologies are going to be built on. We want to ensure that we are players uh, that are you know, taken seriously and have a place on the table with the US and with some of the bigger players as well. And this could not be, um, let's say, showcased better than with the announcement that was made two days ago by Microsoft that it's investing $1.5 billion in a UAE AI company. And it's actually doubling down on the UAE's talent what, and the UAE's... Well, right, but, but what have you learned in the last five years or so, being in that job, that has either reinforced or shifted your perception on what AI will be? So the first thing is actually uh, agility. Uh, in 2017, the focus was on self-driving cars, on the trolley problem. The, even when it talks about AI, people were talking about uh, expert systems, uh, you know, just being decision tree uh, kind of um, machines that people try to deal with. Today, the conversations are about hallucinations, about uh, deep uh, fakes, are about misinformation. And I think we need to have the agility in government to be able to regulate effectively, uh, understand what the technology can and cannot do, and also understand where we can play a role as well as the government. All right. Mm -hmm. Ian, we're, we're going to... We, we, I'm, I'm segmenting us out so that we're across the whole range of issues. Sitting, sitting at the top of it all is where you think we will be in five years. So... If I think about five years ago, uh, my presumptions that have been shaken, or at least that I question today because of AI, five years ago, I would have presumed that democracies and open political systems are ultimately more stable than authoritarian systems. And I would have argued that um, private sector competitive driven economies are more efficient than either state-owned driven economies or private sector monopoly driven economies. I think that what we are seeing now from AI makes me question whether or not those assumptions will remain true in another five years. I wouldn't say that they will absolutely not be, but the direction of travel is at least to question them. But this is not about AI in its technical sense, this is, which is a neutral in a it's sense. It's about the application. It's of about course. the application. It's about our management of it. Well, there's virtually no point in talking about AI unless you're talking about the application of it. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. I'm not worried about existential risks from the robots taking over. I don't care about the paperclip problem. I'm very interested in how actors deploy AI in ways mm -hmm. that will change society, change security, change the economy, and change the stability of our political system. And the problem with that, Professor, is this lot in the room. It's the minister. It's the managing director. It's the people in power. You could say that. <laughs> But look, I think Ian has it exactly right. Oh dear. AI is a then tool. we're on a very slippy slope. <laughs> right, I know, we're I know. Agreeing I know, with I know. Ian Brown. No, no, so that's early. just the, oh, that's the opening salvo. Oh, uh, <laughs> phew. Uh, you know, AI is a tool, and you can use it in many different ways. But I think the problem is that right now we are in a moment where, indeed, there are some impressive achievements of AI, but I don't think we have the measure of it, and we have completely given up on this very obvious truth that we have to develop a workable and fair strategy for using it. Right now, we are more slavishly following where AI is going, which means where a small group of tech leaders and trillions of dollars are pushing AI. And that's not consistent with Ian's very obvious observation that it's a tool you can use it in many different ways. OK, so there's really two aspects on that. And uh, th for, for His Excellency, it's, uh, it's where we're going in terms of how... and it's how we got here. And as the person who's probably been the closest to it, with the exception maybe of the professor, who's been looking at this for longer than any of us, but how has it shifted from where you... Th in 2017, you talked about... Originally, it was about cars and this, that and the other. Now it's about much more existential... It's much more into, the, into life. But how, when you come to regulate it and when you come to deal with it, you've got a, mil a billion and a half from Microsoft, but how do you stop them calling the shots? 
I think, Richard, first is trying to understand what they're talking about. Uh, the biggest challenge when it comes to government decision makers is ignorance when um, dealing with these companies and with, when dealing with this technology. The second thing I'm going to say is we are entering a very interesting phase when it comes to artificial intelligence. The economics of this technology doesn't really make sense. And let me give you a reason uh, for saying this. The uh, outcomes are very impressive, but if you look at the amount of energy that's going to actually it's going into the actual system or the, the compute capabilities that's required for it to be prompted in a way and to come up with an outcome, it's not sustainable. Uh, at one point of time, we need to think of sustainable economic use cases that can help governments really extract value from it. And that can help as well um, justify the billions of dollars that are going into this technology. Uh, in the UAE, we want to be in the frontier. To be in the frontier, we need to make the investments today. But uh, applying it is, an, is a completely different ballgame that would require a lot more understanding of the technology and the economics behind it. Go ahead. Well, the, when, when I think of what is already in front of us, it is happening. That is not something that may happen five years from now. What is already with us is that uh, generative AI is producing things that used to be only possible to be produced by people. I will give you a personal example. Uh, I was celebrating my birthday and my... What, 21 again? <laughs> what can I say? So my tech savvy nieces and nephews and daughter gave me a present. What was it? It was my portrait drawn by artificial intelligence. And it was really interesting. But it wow. made me thinking that something that an artist would have not done now is done by an algorithm. Uh, when we look around, we already see that we deploy artificial intelligence to speed up analysis, to get uh, answers to questions that otherwise would have taken many people, many hours to answer. And you can aspire for a moment when your employee, that is the most perf strongly performing one, is not anymore just an example to follow, but everybody can do the same thing, to be the best in your, in your business. So it is happening. And the question I am asking my team, and I see some of my colleagues here, is would this truly lead to improvements in productivity that are so lagging? Or it would generate all the horrible things that Ian is talking about misinformation, right. disinformation, and the rest. But on this question, and the reason I, I'm not being disrespectful, the reason I've got my phone out is because I did ask Meta's AI, which it has insisted on putting into my WhatsApp. I, I asked it about you, Professor. Mm -hmm. And I said, show me five quotes from Professor uh, on artificial... And it came up with... You're going to cost me a dollar. There are transformative and very consequential choices. <laughs> the object is not to make machines intelligent, but more useful. Mm -hmm. Time is very similar to what went on in the past. We are immeasurably more prosperous, and there was nothing automatic about it. Now, you believe that AI as a productivity gain, what you call so-so automation. Explain. Well, you know, I think... First, I want to start by saying, even when we ask the innocent question, what will AI do to productivity? What will AI do to jobs? Mm -hmm. We're asking the wrong question. We, it will do whatever we choose it to do. It's a very versatile and potentially capable technology, but AI doesn't have in its DNA something that it will do to productivity, something that it will do to jobs, something that it will do to misinformation. This is where, again, our choices matter greatly. Social automation is the name that my collaborator, Pascual Restrepo, and I give to the eagerness with which businesses sometimes automate, substituting machines and algorithms for human creativity. And it doesn't work so well because humans are much better than 
uh, bosses and tech leaders sometimes give them credit. And what you end up with is displaced workers, but not much of the productivity gains. No, I completely agree with you, Kristalina, that AI has the potential to improve productivity. But we have to be realistic. It's not going to create a productivity revolution. It's not going to double our productivity growth. But we can get some quite significant advantages. How would we do that? We would do that by using AI to boost the productivity and expertise of workers. That's what we're not doing. Right, but I remember sitting through mm. Alan Greenspan's Humphrey Hawkins testimony in the 90s when he said there are productivity gains from the internet that we don't fully understand yet. Mm. Are we seeing the same now? Well, again, it depends. I think there are aspects of AI productivity that we cannot understand yet because they're not being used. So let me give you an example. What's the type of productivity gain that I would like to see? I would like to see electricians become better. I think unless we make electricians better with AI, we have no hope of a productivity revolution. How can you make electricians better? Those are not the workers who are looking on ChatGPT to write Shakespearean sonnets or do research. What would it, what would it take to make electricians better? It would take something very different than what we're doing right now. The irony of our age is that information is abundant, useful information is scarce. If you want to solve a problem, good luck finding a way of sh troubleshooting a new challenge you're facing, the electricity grid, shortage of electricians. So we have to transform mm. AI, not the transformative AI, but transform Ooh. the path of AI. 50 in, cents only. In, <laughs> uh, I give you your $1 back. Typical IMF, half a loaf. <laughs> We have to find a way of using AI, generative AI, as a way of, in real time, providing information to electricians so that they can do their job better. They can be trained better. They can deal with the new problems that they haven't encountered on the electricity grid. That's not what we are doing right now. And unless we do that, mm -hmm. I think all of those productivity but dreams surely we are. are going to remain dreams. Surely we are. We are. I mean, we're already seeing radiologists get better. We're already seeing paralegals get better. We're already seeing large numbers of jobs that really matter that are becoming more productive with AI. But that's not where I see true displacement. The mm -hmm. thing that I am most worried about systemically that I think we'll, we'll see displacement on from AI are human relationships. And that's the thing I worry about most. Mm. Uh, the number one best-selling book in the United States right now is a book that is about people, adults, really worried that their kids are yeah. losing out because they're spending too much time intermediated by their smartphones. Mm -hmm. AI is vastly greater than that in its ability not to replace productivity, but to replace human interaction. We already believe that we're engaging with an AI and we're creating relationships like we would with another person. It allows us, it fools us into believing oh, that sure. it's an, a human, but it's not even close to what it will be able to do in that regard within a couple more years. And that's something that companies are not interested in governing. That's something that, frankly, international governance is not yet taking up. And that's something, when I look at the EU AI Act and I look at the American executive order, the only country out there that I see really doing something about it is China, because that is also a threat to the Communist Party, to the authoritarian regime. I'm not, it's not clear to me that that's the future that we want to head into. All right, into. but I'm going to hold you there. Go back to your excellency. On this point, how have you avoided that age-old problem of knowing the price of everything and the value of nothing, in the sense that, yes, you can get the big companies in and you can build an economy around AI, but to Ian's point about the relationships, the management of it, the, the fact you are still dealing with, um, with computers, not with humans. So I think there are two sides there to this. The first is, if we look at the current regulation landscape, there are these countries that are trying to, or these blocks that are trying to over-regulate, and maybe that works for their geographies. There are certain demog demographies that are trying to under-regulate. Uh, there's always this Goldilocks scenario of trying to do it just right. We cannot actually rush into over-regulating as a country because we tend to work with whether it's talent or companies or even uh, you know the, the compliance issue with other governments as well. So we tend to be towards, let's say, the, the American side of this, which is regulate enough to ensure that the problems are, are uh, uh, regulated, but without over-regulating and, and let's say, being at the very other end of the spectrum. There's another issue, which is there are certain uh, rules that exist today, or laws or regulations, 
that exist yep. pre-AI that can be implemented on AI. So AI being used for fraud, for example, is still fraud. And there's, you know, regulations against it. Right. But, 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 but to the point which I think sort of we devolve down to, which is one of humanity and our ability to manage it, how are you discovering... Because you are, you are ahead of the game in that respect. And how are you managing the human aspect of it? The only way you can manage the human aspect is you actually have to bring the human forward to understand what this technology is and what the role is on this. So we are working on a mass countrywide uh, set of programs to get everyone to understand what this technology is, what impact it's going to have on their lives, and how they can play a role in shaping future policies with us. Because I don't think the government can do it on its own. It's absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Th this idea, uh, this idea, Professor, of uh, training people is, seems to me to be a large part of the answer that, to the problem that Ian is talking about, training people to be able to use these technologies in a way. Is that realistic? It might be realistic in a relatively small environment of experiment like the UAE, but is it realistic across the EU, across Well, it depends what, what kind of training we're talking about. It could, depends on how we organize production. So if we, if what you have in mind is right. training people to use ChatGPT prompt engineering, that's not going to get you anywhere. I actually disagree with Ian that we're having massive productivity gains in, uh, in radiology or, or in all of these areas. There are some small gains, but if you m sum them up, the influence of that at the macroeconomy level is not much. So it's not going to get us where Kristalina wants. What you need to do is really make workers more productive and more versatile in the kinds of problems they solve. That's the kind of training that I'm talking about. So train electricians to be able to deal with a broader range of problems so that the spectrum of human creativity, decision-making, problem-solving expands. So that's what I'm talking about when I say training. What we see uh, today is, uh, as always, a big difference in opinions. Uh, our own research at the IMF says we can get up to 0.8% growth in productivity. We like to be precise. We're not going to say about 1%. It's 0.8%. <laughs> Then there are studies that are much more optimistic. They, the analysis there says somewhere between 1% and 3.5% over the next five years, we can see growth in productivity. Uh, then there are some, um, our dear friend here among them, saying it's going to be negligible. Don't, uh, don't bet your uh, house on it. We simply don't know just yet. But what we do know, we know two things. One. If artificial intelligence is to come in spite, it would gobble up a lot of energy. And uh, uh, His Excellency brought this point. So countries that today position themselves to produce massively renewable energy in a world of climate change will have comparative advantage. These would be the countries where Companies would say, we want to come to you. And two, the second thing we know is that there are certain elements that make it more likely to succeed. At the fund, we came up with these four elements. Digital infrastructure, if you don't have it, <laughs> what artificial intelligence? Uh, yeah. Secondly, human capital, people yeah. could, that can actually deal with it. Thirdly, innovation that flows in the economy, makes that thing work, and fourth, ethics. Now, at the fund, can I do my commercial? I promise it's only one. <laughs> at the fund, we have created a index, Artificial Intelligence Preparedness Index, and we ranked 175 right. countries on how they perform on these four criteria. You know what surprised me? What surprised me the most is that the U.S. did not come on top. Why didn't the U.S. come on top? Obviously, in innovation, they're unmatched. They're a mile ahead. 
But when it comes down to digital infrastructure, this is a big country, it's not accessible everywhere. And when it comes down to investment in human capital, in schools, it varies. So my broader point, can I, can I just finish? It's my broader, it's my house. <laughs> my broader point is the following. There are elements in the uh, advancements in artificial intelligence that are good anyway. Renewable energy on scale is good anyway. Having digital infrastructure and access to it is good anyway, with or without artificial intelligence. So I, I think we can, we can say there is something that is already here. There are parts of it that are good anyway. Why not embrace it and kind of love it? And uh, uh, We'll come back to that. Uh, OK. <laughs> We'll come back right. to that. You know, love is my We're at the spring feature. meetings of the IMF. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about love. I think we're in trouble. Um, <laughs> I wanna, I'm going to let you go, uh, Excellency. After the last question for you, just for the second, was the event of the last 48 hours and the rains that hit your country, and thank God that we, uh, you know, infrastructure held in a sense and there wasn't loss of life or greater loss of life across the region mm. but did it teach you or us or one did it teach one that you can have all the ai you like but if the heavens open up you're screwed um can i be very honest oh, well i would hope you would be <laughs> um if you so you know we we try to reflect on this uh, today and um, I think there's a lot more that can be done always. Um, if you look at, uh, since history started recording precipitation, I think we've seen probably the third largest uh, amount of rainfall within 24 hours in the last 100 years, um, 48 hours ago, as a country. Mm. There is very little you can do to prepare for this. Uh, and the fact that there were zero deaths in the UAE because of this uh, you know, climate change anomaly is a testament to the systems and the rigor that are there. AI can help us a lot, but I think you need human ingenuity, you need um, mm -hmm. resilience, you need agility to be able to tackle this. Mm -hmm. That remains. I wish you a mm. good cleanup operation. And uh, next time I see you, I'll, uh, well, since I come from the UK, where it rains persistently, I'll bring you a strong pair of Wellington boots. <laughs> which uh, you, you I'd love that. You've got excellent. <laughs> Thank you. I'll borrow yours then. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank, you. Thank you for right. joining us. As we continue here, the, the issue seems to me come, it comes down to is our ability, as you say, to manage, but our ability to train. And I don't mean to train the physics of it. I mean train the handling of it. That we're losing hands down. Yeah, I mean, that's so multidimensional when it comes to that. First of all, we need to get the direction of AI, the type of AI and what it does and who it does it for. But then we also need to create much better capabilities for humans and machines, algorithms to work together. Because if what I'm suggesting is even part of the solution, which is using AI for making humans better, then communication between the AI system and the human decision maker is key. Right now, that's completely, completely bad. Why? Because all of these AI models are so black box, it's impossible to understand why they're making certain recommendations or what it is that they're trying to usefully communicate. And there are studies that show exactly because of this reason, uh, when decision, good skilled decision makers, such as uh, doctors, use AI tools, actually they keep on making systematic mistakes. But the the, the, the elevation some water, the elevation of AI uh, to, to, to its current levels, I, I was saying before we came out here, one very, very senior executive of an IBM basically said, for the first time, digital technology or digitalization or AI has risen to the level of strategy in geopolitics. And we see this, don't we, in, in terms of the relationship with China? the restrictions on exports and uh, chips uh, and the like, and that will only get worse. Just today, 
Bruno Le Maire was saying to me, of, of France was said to me in an interview, we need to be more on our guard. Well, I mean, the direction of travel, uh, we talk about de-risking, but the direction of travel when we talk about technology and national security is decoupling. And the United States has made a decision to do everything it can to prevent the Chinese from having access to advanced semiconductors and also pressuring its allies to do same, which means the Chinese have to invest in their own. Um, the fact that TikTok increasingly looks like it's going to be forced to be spun out uh, of Chinese ownership if they want to continue to have access to the American market. Facebook, of course, other US data-heavy consumer-engaged social platforms don't have access to the Chinese market. That's not going to bring us closer together as countries. It's not going to bring us closer together as people. It's going to split us apart. Now, to the extent... But is it the right policy as seen from... The West. Well, as it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, as seen from the zero-sum national security concerns of the United States and protecting the U.S., sure. But if you're talking about trying to address climate change or trying to address a world of new disruptive technologies, those are global issues. I mean, like, for example, the United States and the Europeans are now saying EVs coming from China are too inexpensive. We've got to tariff them. That You could argue that's a good decision for an Ohio laborer, but it's a bad decision if you want to bring carbon emissions down to hit your 2030, your 2050 targets. We have to talk about both of those things. You but can't talk about one. We want to avoid, Professor, exactly the problem that happened with digitization, which was <clears throat> everyone was told productivity gains will all be magnificent. And then they lost their jobs and there wasn't the money put into mm. reskilling, there wasn't the money put into retraining, mm -hmm. and therefore those people who lost their jobs suffered and we followed that opportunity again. 100%, yes, I think... So what do we do? Well, again, I think what I suggested is, uh, is exactly motivated by these concerns. If <coughs> instead of using AI as a general purpose technology, not just for automation, but also for making workers more productive, creating new tasks, creating new useful products. I think that will help with inequality as well as productivity. The problem, why is it that robots increase inequality so much in the United States? Because we used robots to completely eliminate a whole slew of manufacturing blue-colored jobs. Whereas if you look at the experiences in South Korea, Japan, or Germany, when they introduced the robots, they tried to upskill the workers, and the blue-color workers became technicians and mm -hmm. uh, supervisory yeah. workers, inspection workers, maintenance workers. We didn't do that. We threw them out of jobs yeah. wholesale, and we didn't create new tasks. We didn't create new jobs. And the outcome was, OK, fine, robots are actually pretty productive. So the productivity gains weren't completely trivial, but we didn't make the best of them, and we got a huge amount of inequality and joblessness out of that. So if I can jump in on that for a second. The problem over the past 50 years was not globalization. It was globalism. It was decisions being made by a small number of beneficiaries, very powerful, that said, we're not going to actually pay attention to the fact that the social contract is eroding. The problem for global society in the next five years is not AI, it's techno-utopianism. Yeah. It's a small number of people that are basically saying, no, this is just going to take care of itself, and we don't Who? need to intervene. Who is that small number of people? The magnificent Do you want names? Seven. You, want Mar <laughs> you want Mark Andreessen out there? I mean, I mean, we can talk about that. I mean, there are the new, if anyone that has a manifesto, right, is probably someone you want to at least well, be a on, little we have skeptical to be so of. so thankful of Mark Andreessen, because, you know, the, he wrote it down. This is the no, that's right. message I get from tech leaders everywhere, but they don't put it down on paper. And then when I describe, this is the vision of tech leaders to automate, automate, and then just go as fast as, and break things, and then get permission or uh, later. forgiveness later. When People don't think that's correct, but Mark Andreessen saw... wrote it down. Yep. So thanks. Well, Tomorrow. I would say, we saw a little glimpse of that. I wasn't expecting to go down this road, so now my mind's trying to remember which court case it was where we saw Elon Musk... Oh, um, Elon Musk's email... Oh, um, it's ChatGPT and uh, OpenAI. We saw Elon Musk's emails in Discovery <clears throat> five, seven years ago, what he and what they were all saying about what they were all going to do. Well, the, 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 the worries about inequality coming out from technology <coughs> that advances very rapidly without 
care for what are the consequences are very real. We had done it, as we just said, we saw how that led to push back on an integrated global economy. Never mind, an integrated global economy makes, a, makes us better off. The risk is very real that we may see increase in inequality within countries and across countries. Unless, unless now, not five years from now, we think about these consequences and we discuss them in places like this. Uh, 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 I want to ask the audience a very simple question. Oh, here we go. How many of you have used chat, GPT or equivalent? You've just Raise... stolen my clothes. I was just about to ask them that. Oh, well, see, we, we, are, we well, are becoming How many more... have you used chat, GPT? Let's see. More than once. <laughs> <laughs> Um, almost every day, every day. Let's see. Oh God, that's worrying. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It's serious. It's here. Okay, put your hand up. Who's used chat? What do you use it for? <laughs> no, come on. What? What do you use it for? Give me an example. Uh, summarize work. Fine. Summarize work. Who else? Yes. What do you use it for? Writing and editing. Oh God, help us. <laughs> what do you use it for? To compare different models of vacuum cleaners. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> One more. That's Who else? What's it? Right there, yes. Yeah. Research different government schemes that have childcare subsidies. What? You just basically say, hey, Jack, Chief, or uh, Meta. Where's different models? How are different funding? Now, one, thank you. By the, oh, sorry, one more question, if I don't mind. Please. How many of you are actually paying for ChatGPT? Wow. That's more than I thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, here we go. Right. All those methods, they, to, to a large extent, those issues or those um, things that it's being used for are merely replacing traditional either Googling or research I I in that sense. It, um, but would you consider... Go on, you're sneering. No. I don't like your sneer. No, <laughs> it's not just replacing Google. Uh, I mean, you know, even the one that you used to get some quotes from Daron wasn't just replacing Google. That would have taken you a lot longer to actually do with Google. No, this is something that's actually helping to, mm -hmm. you know, sort of kick off creativity. It's helping with serious research tasks. Now, if you end up just using it and pasting it, you've got problems. <coughs> but, I mean, I can't think of a per an analyst in my organization or an analyst I know broadly that wouldn't consider using this as an essential input going forward or a coder or any of a number of other fields. And, okay. and, and Providing it's sense. backed up by a raft of policies that says this is merely one, this must be checked, blah, 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 blah. Of course. The normal standards. Well, it, we have to be also... Uh, careful not to go too far as to the role and reliability of um, chat GPT and other forms of generative AI. I'll give you an example. One of my colleagues, a very good man, tells me that he asked the question, uh, who is the managing director of the IMF? Oh God. And he got an answer, it was him. <laughs> Arthur. So, what I year, said, what oh, year did he ask about? What sorry, year, no, what year right did he now, ask about? Oh, who okay. is now the managing director? He has never been a managing director. So, it, I don't mind somebody to take a big chunk of my job, and in this sense, <laughs> thank you. But uh, the reliability is not quite yet there. Uh, and we have to recognize that there is a lot of space for humans to apply judgment. But we, but this, go ahead, I'm sorry. But that would change over time, and here is the biggest right. risk. What if a, te a technology that learns on its own starts learning wrongly on its own and that exponentially goes to lunacy on steroids? Then what? And this is why I think we have to recognize that we are in early, early stages, right. that we have to take more actively a role of defining, as you said, what we want, and then how we know we are getting it, and what are the, the, the guardrails that we are putting on this thing before it is too late. So, what is the legitimate fora for dis for, for, for doing that, since there is an inability mm -hmm. for 
east, west, north, south. I mean, look at the climate. Mm. Uh, the look at COP and its inability to... It, it gets there in the end, but in a messy, horrible way. And even then, the final result is not satisfactory and will fail to reach the targets. So what is the correct forum for this? Well, the answer is we don't have today one place to deal with uh, this uh, new potentially potentially dot 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 technology a dollar save the dollar uh, <laughs> we we don't have it so what what is the alternative the alternative is for inclusive places like the IMF we have 190 members on the issues that are in our competence which is how could that impact the economy? What are the risks for inequality? What is a good way to define some common objectives and rules to do that and not to wait to be, to be asked? Because uh, it's, who, who is going to do the asking? We have, so look, here is reality. We have in the United States seven companies that are dominating this space, correct? the magnificent seven. They're doing potentially great service to humanity, but in a way in which inclusiveness, views of others, not easy to penetrate. So what do we do? Do we just wash our hands and say, well, these guys irresponsibly are doing it? Or we try to form this fora where we advance that commonality of understanding. And I'll tell you something here, in our uh, meetings, we are going to have that kind of engagement of everybody because, uh, Ian, we need everybody to engage. Can I, can I just ask you to clarify? Mm -hmm. Have you just added, extended, amended, increased? the role of the fund. <laughs> I mean, have you just basically given yourself a new objective? Absolutely not. Everything so you we have. Do, every, everything we do is written in our articles of agreement. What do the articles say? This institution is to promote cooperation for monetary, for, sorry, for macroeconomic financial stability, growth and employment. These are issues that affect potentially macroeconomic and financial stability, growth and employment. So we cannot ignore them. Yes, in 1944, they didn't say, and the IMF in 2024 should invite Richard Quest <laughs> to talk about artificial intelligence. But we are, and, and I'm very serious, we, we have something that, that is already with us, you saw the hands in the air, that has potential to improve our lives, but also potential to go right. wrong. And we have to think of the economic consequences of it. Do people agree with that? I'm now asking for oh, no. people agree. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. How many people in this room work for the IMF? <laughs> Let's see, I'm curious. How many of you guys work for us? All right. Well, All yeah, right. so it's not so bad. You know, we have the... Ian, so, I, I think one thing we all agreed on at the beginning of this panel was that we're not focused just on the technology, we're focused on the applications mm, of the technology, completely. the deployment of the technology. Now, if you're asking how we're going to get our hands around that, how we're going to manage it, we need to understand, we need to recognize that the models of the companies that are rolling it out will determine a very significant piece of how these things are deployed. Example, mm. you look at just the difference of Twitter under Jack Dorsey an X under Elon Musk, I would argue that the experience, the, the governance, the model of those two companies, same company, are radically di more different than your experience of governance in the United States under Biden versus Trump. Now, when we start talking about AI 
and the platforms that will be dominant in rolling AI out to corporations, to developing countries who we haven't talked about yet, and I hope we can close yeah, we with will. a little bit of that. We will. that and, and, with, and with consumers and with mm -hmm. citizens, the reality is these companies are way ahead of the curve in determining what the experience is going to be, the product's going to be. So when I think about governance, I recognize I don't want companies regulating themselves, but they're going to be a part of the picture. It's going to be a hybrid okay. set of solutions, just like on climate change. If you didn't have the big banks and the pension funds and the corporations in the room with the governments, we wouldn't be hitting 2050. Mm. And I think for AI, which is coming much faster, yep. it's going to be a hybrid model. Okay, yeah. but yeah. I'll come to you in one second, but I, yeah. just on this point. Mm -hmm. If you look at the inability or inefficiency, I should say, of regulators, take EU, US, they either go for antitrust activity, which takes 15 years, ends up back to where you started from and everybody's forgotten about it and it's all irrelevant, or they legislate or they regulate. And AI is moving faster than any Correct. of them can do it. So that's not a satisfactory solution. You're right, and I think what that means is that my hope, and you may say this is unacceptable, but it's kind of like we've had on climate, mm and just gonna happen faster, is that what we end up setting up in the US, in Europe, and global governance will at least get the right people in the room asking the right questions so that when the initial crisis or crises hit, we will have a jump start in be able, being able to deploy real capital, political capital, economic capital, otherwise, Who to leads respond that to those crises. What? Who leads that forum? I don't think a person does I mean, that. which institution? I, well, you just talked about your Magnificent Seven, so they're clearly in the room. Mm -hmm. A bunch of serious experts and analysts on these technologies are right. in the room, and the governments are in the room. You can't do it without those groups together. Well, I, yeah. I applaud uh, our managing director for taking on this additional responsibility. We sorely need it. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, if even a quarter of the promise of AI is realized, it's going to change the global division of labor. Mm -hmm. If you use AI and for authoritarian purposes, for pro-democratic purposes, for social media, mental health, mm -hmm. it affects everybody in the world. There are five billion people who have no voice. Mm -hmm. AI is being done to them. Five billion people who have zero voice. Who's going to represent their point of view? Who's going to represent the Brazil's point of view, Indonesia's point of view, Malaysia's point of view, Turkey's point of view, South Africa's point of view? So now the IMF has just taken on that role. That's fantastic. Well, <laughs> if you look at the IMF's late, last research on this, which you and I talked about, and yeah. it's, more, it's, it's more worrying than that <laughs> because you have the developed economies mm -hmm. which have yeah. infrastructure, relatively much higher levels of education, mm -hmm. the chat GPTs or whatever, and even their industries, they will be gaining whatever so-so economic advantages, mm -hmm. productivity gains, rapidly, and the other rest of the, 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 the have-nots, if you will, will be even worse off. Yeah. Well, the um, analysis shows that uh, around 60% of jobs in advanced economies will be impacted. Some of them positively, they would be enhanced, some of them negatively, they may disappear. But the impact is going to be very significant. On average in the world, it would be 40% of jobs. In low-income countries, 26% of jobs. You can say, oh, thank God, they're not getting this uh, tsunami to hit them. But on the other hand, what it means is that they're falling behind again. And this is why I am a big proponent of thinking about the economic opportunities and risks in a way that brings everybody together. This is where the fact that we have 190 members, among them rich countries, poor countries, makes it important that we don't, we don't ignore a topic that we know it's like a massive wave that is lifting Boats. But you have to now put flesh onto the bones of that wish. Of course. What does it mean? It, this is why it was so important for us to look at these indicators for preparedness. What it translates into is we know that in um, developing countries, only half of the population has access to the Internet. We know that in Africa, there are 600 million people without access to electricity. 
we know that in terms of quality of education, there is a big difference between Singapore, which, by the way, is number one in uh, AI preparedness, uh, and, uh, and developing countries. And that means that then we reach out to the, uh, to the World Bank, to the, the regional development banks, to the countries themselves, saying, wake up. You have to move faster because the world is... They not, can't not move fast enough. They, they, you know, so this is where we are wrong. Uh, we, we have this tendency to say, uh, oh, you're behind, you are destined to stay behind. I'll give you one example. Right. Jamaica. Oh. Jamaica, 10 years ago, was a place nobody wanted to really go to because of crime, because of bad infrastructure. Jamaica today is flourishing. How did it happen? Because there is a determined government and then we had right. multiple programs, so a bit of, sorry, that's the second marketing of the fund. But it was really the country turning a corner. It is possible. And it, what it takes is political will and leadership. And then everybody lining up to support the country. Richard, you were worried that we were all going to agree, so I want to disagree with you. You fell into the trap of buying the line, we cannot regulate AI. I think we can regulate AI, and I think it's essential. I think there are so many examples that show AI can be regulated. Actually, Who? Regulate. China. China is regulating AI extremely well. They have objectives that we don't agree with, but uh, all sorts of AI companies are responsible mm -hmm. for carrying out the agenda of the Communist Party. Yeah, Taiwan. Taiwan has done an... I think a lot of people who talk about regulation should first go and no, look no. at what Taiwan is doing. Taiwan you, has you several layers of uh, regulation that are just amazingly ahead of what we are doing in the United States or the West. Right, but that's my part. No, you, you've fallen into my trap, which is, <laughs> which is, yes, you can regulate it. The US chooses not to. Well, that's a political point, but you can <laughs> regulate it. I think we but can. But you make end up points. with a patchwork quilt of regulation which does not mm -hmm. mesh efficiently in a technology... No, I, I actually disagree with that also. The U European Union mm. actually has played a role of regulatory readers. I'm not agreeing with everything they have done, but whatever you, Europe introduces a new AI or digital regulation, other countries have to follow because tech companies have to respond in order to be, have access That's to that market. So actually, if US changed its mind and decided to regulate AI, which it must sorely do, then I think we would have a global system of regulation. But the big problem is that either one of these approaches, to go back to Daron's earlier point, is as of now basically forgetting about the developing countries in the world who don't have the access, right. the models aren't training That's their data, the IMF, IMF they're not getting the that. corporations. The IMF is going to be a component of it. The United Nations has a high-level uh, panel, yep. which Omar and I are on, which is going to be a component of it. But let's be very clear. Uh, the, if, if When you're talking about something that the power is overwhelmingly in the hands of a small number of organizations in developed countries that are driven by shareholder return, and, they're, and they know their competitors are breathing down their neck, so they have to move really fast. Right. They're not bad people, but, but the, they're badly incented, right? And, and, and that is why we have, the world has sustainable development goals. Our revealed preferences that we're not very interested in hitting them, but AI has to be a technology that is deployed but hang on in, in service of hang those on, goals. Hang on. I'm going to come back to where we started in a sense, because we're coming towards the end. The, this is moving faster than we can, in some senses, no. ca uh, manage, cope, regulate, whatever word you want to use. The panel. <laughs> well, I was talking about AI, but I'll take the panel as well. This is moving faster. Therefore, your wonderful high-level group at the UN will still be talking about something or other concerning with it when it's 45 miles down the road in the opposite direction. But the speed is a choice as well. But it's, like AI but it's happening! Have it. Well, because we're not <laughs> regulating it. We're not regulating it. The venture capital fueled model of AI has a tendency to go very fast because what part of the business model is 
increase your market share, right. whatever the cost, monopolize data, that's leading to extremely fast movement. That's a choice that we're letting that happen. We've got, come here, I just want to finish with this. So we'll start with you, Ian. Five years from now, what will it look like, AI? Um, what will, how will we have harnessed the benefits, gained the productivities, faced the risks, and either be out of jobs and whatever, five years from now. As long as there's not a major sudden economic recession shock, uh, I'm not as worried about employment because I think that that will hit all at the sudden when there's a problem right. and then every all the CEOs say, oh my God, we've got to shed employees and we can do that. So there's that. Um, I, it, I, I'm generally more optimistic. I'm on the optimistic side with Kristalina and others in terms of how much growth and productivity and reduction of waste we'll see from this in five years' time. I am negative about the quick tilt towards uh, human beings fighting wars and moving towards machines fighting wars. We're already seeing that in Gaza, and I think we're going to see that much more right. quickly than people are prepared for. In five years' time, that might be, other than the social displacement point, the thing that most concerns me. If there's one person that you would allow to regulate AI, who would it be? One person? No, no, no. There's no one person. There's no one person. One organization. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I can't, I, I think, I, I'd probably say the European Union because oh. it is the single model of supranational governance that has shown itself to be most effective and, mo and closest to actually the citizens. That's probably what I would say. Hmm, Professor. Well, my... The three Europeans here, it's extraordinary. I, think <laughs> I expected Europeans to go... Well, there's huge uncertainty, so it's, it's not easy to say that. But my point estimate would be that in five years' time, the economy won't have changed materially. We would be mostly doing the kinds of things we're doing. We would be using some of the generative AI tools with small but noticeable productivity improvements. Capital labor income inequality would have increased because the Magnificent Seven, which might have become Magnificent Nine or not, I don't know, would have become even more dominant because we would have chosen not to regulate them. And unfortunately, I think the political conversation would have deteriorated quite significantly because I think the main business model that's active in the tech industry is to use generative AI for manipulation purposes, and that's going to degrade, degrade the quality um, of political conversation. And assuming you had the sword and you could dub on the shoulders of the one person or organization, who would you give I it to? I hate to agree with Ian because he's an optimist and I'm not, but I would say European Commission as well, mm. for the same reasons. Mm. Very good. As a European, yep. All right. I, they now, didn't say you. <laughs> no, of course they wouldn't say me. They say me and then... Uh, they are no more on the list of my, my friends. <laughs> I'm, not taking this, I'm not taking this monkey on my shoulders. Right. Uh, but let, so are you asking me the same question? Uh, yes, five yes, years yes. from now? Yes, yes. Uh, I think that five years from now, from now we will have advanced. Um, there would be things that, that today we don't know that can be done better. Uh, we will see, each and every one of us will, will see some changes in the way we live, in the way we uh, mm -hmm. communicate. Uh, I think that um, uh, the jury is really out on whether we would have the wisdom to try to stay a bit, if not ahead, at least with right. the changes that are happening. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, what is the best uh, place, I don't think it exists at the moment. Uh, I think it will be, it will organically come. There will be forum that would be created. And I hope that wise people would engage to create this, uh, this uh, forum. There is, right, I mean, I, I love the European Commission. I served for seven years. I think that the, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, uh, deficiencies of, of Europe is that Europe tends to be more into regulating then maybe sometimes healthy for innovation. So how do you strike this balance? That's an entirely different discussion for another yes, panel. Yes, for another panel. Uh, but uh, what I do believe, in my heart of heart, I believe that we will be in a world in which more things get done. Right. In five years' time, 
you, we now know, will still be in your job. <laughs> uh, and hopefully, in five years' time, I don't know whether I'll be in mine, but you'll invite me back so I can remind you of what you said five years ago. That's a deal. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, yes. our panel. Thank you. Now, I want to demonstrate something that AI cannot do. Hug you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.